Yeah, so Isaiah chapter 44, and hopefully you'll get to 45 today. Um, <clears throat> I know I've talked about this before, but and and hopefully you're not tired of hearing me talk about it, but uh, this this whole second half of Isaiah, chapters 40 through 66, um, it described to us God's great rescue plan, you know, that rescue plan that he put in place in the opening chapters of Genesis, right after the fall of human beings in chapter three, uh, we see uh, God's glorious rescue plan being put into place. And uh, we're seeing it step by step worked out uh, throughout the scripture. We're seeing it step by step worked out in our own lives. And we're seeing glimpses into the far future well, maybe it's not so far. Maybe it's sooner than we think. Um, when God is going to complete that process and make uh, everything new, and uh, you know, that's just uh, wow. <laughs> you know, um, so uh, the uh, I divided this uh, just for purposes of study into two sections. The first twenty-three verses of chapter forty-four. Um, again, are predicting that everything is going to be rescued. But uh, before we go any further, what do I mean by rescued? What do I mean when I talk about rescuing the cosmos? Um, <clears throat> well, it's not just the cosmos, of course. It starts with us as individuals. So when I talk about God's rescue project, I mean uh, God's God has, through Christ, through what Jesus did on the cross, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus— uh, he has brought us forgiveness of all our sin and deliverance from all of our sin. Uh, he is also in the process, this is also part of his rescue pro uh, project, uh, he is in the process of transforming our lives. Our bodies have become temples of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives within us. Theologically, we call this sanctification. Um, he is in the process of setting us apart, making us like Jesus, transforming us, uh, renewing our minds, uh, changing our, our very character and nature, not all at once, but slowly, gradually, lovingly making us more and more like Jesus. That's also part of his rescue project. Uh, in addition to that, as we look out into the future, there's coming a time and and again, uh, you know, maybe it's not that far off. I, I hope not. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. You know, Maranatha, the Lord cometh. Um, there's coming a time when heaven and earth will be united. Heaven is very, very close. The realm of the angels is all around us. We're just usually not aware of it, you know. But there is coming a time when that uh, veil between us and the heavenly realm uh, will be lifted, and where uh, heaven and earth will be interacting together, just like it was before the fall. Um, so you'll be able to, to you know, hang out with angels and talk to cherubim and figure out what those um, strange creatures are that have all the wings and stuff that are flying around the throne. Uh, the rescue project also means that all hurt and all destruction, everything that's evil uh, in the entire universe is going to be banished. There'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more bereavement. Everything is going to be transformed. Everything will be made new. So it isn't just the forgiveness of our sins and the transformation of, of us, the redeemed. It's also the transformation of everything. <laughs> it's the transformation of all of creation. Everything, uh, you know, stars and um, uh, uh, planets and uh, animals and trees and fish and everything is going to be completely transformed to be the way God intended it for it to be. The entire cosmos, all of creation will be saturated with divine love. That's what I mean when I talk about God's great rescue project. And God uh, initiated that process in the garden. Um, he sealed it. He, uh, as it were, effectively completed it on the cross. 
and he's in the process of working that out now. And so here in chapter 44, uh, God is speaking through the prophet Isaiah, and he's speaking to the nation of Israel. And you remember, of course, that at this time, uh, the nation of Israel is in captivity. Uh, in 587 BC, the Babylonians destroyed the city of Jerusalem. In the process, they completely destroyed the temple that Solomon had built uh, some five centuries before this. And they, uh, of course, the, a, lot of, a lot of the Jewish people were killed in that process. Those that survived were taken captive. Um, they were um, taken away to the Mesopotamian area, to the land of Babylon. Now, they were not all settled in Babylon like in the same neighborhood, you know, where they could kind of reconstruct their lives. They were spread throughout this Babylonian empire, uh, which made all of them feel displaced. They, they were in a strange land, strange customs, language they don't understand. Um, and of course, they're, they're essentially slaves. They're, they're given uh, very menial, hard jobs to do, you know, like, like chopping wood for the, for the uh, you know, everybody that lives on this street, or that kind of thing. Um, so they're in captivity. Um, they're scattered. They're displaced. Um, and, they, and they're crying out, you know, to be repatriated, to come back to their homeland to have a place that they can call their own. And God speaks to them through the prophet Isaiah. And what God says is, but now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. So he refers to the Jews uh, both by the name of Jacob and by the name Israel. Uh, and I think there's a strong hint there, maybe even more than a hint, that the nation which divided after the reign of Solomon into two countries, Northern Kingdom Israel, Southern Kingdom uh, Judah, are going to be reunited. Um, there, there won't be any more North and South. There won't be any more um, division between uh, these uh, people who, who, of course, are all related to each other. But now, Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I've chosen, thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you in the womb, and will help you. Do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. Jeshurun is a um, term of endearment. Um, uh, different scholars translate it different ways, but it basically is a term of endearment. It means that you're uh, someone who is very dearly loved. So God is emphasizing his love. Now, he's talking to the nation of Israel. He's not talking to individuals. You know, I've heard a lot of people quote verse 2 uh, to say, well, see, the, the Bible says God formed me in the womb. Well, I, I mean, God did form you in the womb. <laughs> uh, but this verse doesn't say that. Um, this verse is talking about God forming the nation. Uh, in other words, God's saying, I've been with you since your inception, uh, before you were even a nation. You know, when, when, you were, when you were just, you know, 12 brothers that couldn't get along with each other hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And, and, and then when you were 12 kind of scattered clans, um, related, but, but not unified in any way. But you, you weren't a nation until David made them into a nation. And that was around 1000 BC, very roughly. So about 500 years before this. Um, so what God's saying there in verse 2 is uh, to the nation of Israel, he's saying, I, I, I was there when you, uh, at the inception of the nation. And I loved you then, and I'm going to love you, and I do love you now, and I'm going to help you. So don't fear. And then he promises that he's going to bless the land. He's not only going to bring them back into the land, but of course, remember, this is an agricultural society. So God says, I'm going to pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I'll pour my spirit upon your descendants and my blessing on your offspring. They shall spring up like a green tamarisk. Tamarisk is a kind of tree, uh, like willows by flowing streams. 
this person will say, I'm, I'm the Lord's. I belong to the Lord. Another will be called by the name of Jacob. And yet another will write on, on the hand, the Lord's, and adopt the name of Israel. In other words, people are going to be clamoring to be associated with God's people. I, he's saying, I'm going to bring you back into the land, and I'm going to bless you in the land so that you can be what I created you to be. The reason God chose Israel to start with is, isn't because he likes Jews better than anybody else. It's because he wanted to form a nation, and he chose Abraham. He chose the descendants of Abraham not because of anything great that they had done or because they were superhuman or anything, but he chose Abraham and, and then uh, he chose Isaac, one of Abraham's sons, and then he chose Jacob, one of uh, uh, Isaac's sons, and then he chose the 12 sons of Jacob to make this nation. But why? Well, the Apostle Paul answers that question for us. He chose them in order to show the world his love and his grace and his mercy. The idea was, I'm going to take these people and I'm going to so inundate them with love and mercy, and they're going to be so, um, they're going to reflect that love in the things that they do and the things that they say. They're going to be different from all the other nations. And that's going to cause the other nations, you know, who are, in, in the middle of their wars and their greed and stuff, they're going to be able to look at Israel and say, oh, we want to be like that. Oh, you got, what's your, what's your God's name? Can you introduce us to the, to the true and the living God? That was the idea. Uh, and that's why God is gathering them back. Uh, of course, you know the story time and time again, they did not reflect the love of God. Uh, but God never, ever, ever gives up. And finally, of course, God comes in the person of Jesus and absorbs within himself all sin and iniquity on the cross and all evil in the entire universe. He absorbs it within himself and everything on that Good Friday, as I've said several times before, changed. Uh, not very many people recognized it, but everything began to change right then on Good Friday. And, and there, there was a shaking, there was a, a, an, an earthquake, dead people started to wake up, you know, uh, there was a transformation that took place. And God is working that out now. And how is he working that out? By creating an Israel made up of people who understand who he is, Jews and Gentiles bond and free, male and female, this group of people who are called by God's name, reflecting the, this is the plan, reflecting the love of God so that the rest of the world will be attracted, not to us, not to our churches, not to our denominations, but attracted to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the world knowing who he is. Uh, there's a picture of some of the wildflowers in Southern California right now. Uh, the reason why God is rescuing is because of his love. He formed Israel. He tells Israel not to fear. And he promises that he's going to bring them blessings, uh, rescues them so that the Messiah can come and rescue the cosmos. Verse 6, thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and, and his Redeemer, not only is he King of Israel, he's the Redeemer of Israel, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, I am the last. Reminds us of Revelation, doesn't it? Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let them proclaim it. Let them declare and set it forth before me. Who has announced from old the things to come? Let them tell us what is yet to be. Do not fear or be afraid. Have I not told you from old and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God beside me? There is no other rock. I know not one. God says, look, all these people are calling on these other so-called deities. 
But have any of those deities ever predicted the future like I do? Have any of those other deities showed you what's going to happen before it happens? Have any of those other deities proven to be a safe place where you can ground your life? No, I know not one, he says. So uh, God is assuring the people that salvation is on its way, that grace, that love is going to win out in the end. And he's reminding them that the true and the living God is our king. He is our Lord of hosts. He's our, our eternal rock. We can build our lives on him. Jesus said, the person who hears my word and does it is like a person who builds his house on a solid rock foundation. The rains fall, the flood tides rise, the winds blow, uh, but the house stands strong against the storms of life because it's built on not just hearing, but also doing the word of God. That's what true faith is. It's, it's doing and it's hearing and doing the word of God. Now, before we leave that passage, you know, God says, don't be afraid. Um, I, I can't remember. Someone told me that there are I, I and I haven't counted to to know if it's true, but someone told me that there are 365 verses in the Bible that tell us not to be afraid. Uh, so if that's the case, then there'd be one for every day of the year. Um, here's one of those passages where God says, "Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid." But you know, it's important to remember, I think, that fear is not a sin. Fear is an affliction. I think Jesus was afraid in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was not looking forward to being tortured to death on a Roman cross. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is doing what God has called you to do in spite of the fear. So God strengthens us to do what's needed even when we're being afraid. He comforts us with his presence. But I just wanted to throw that in. It's kind of a little bit of an aside, but uh, I think sometimes we get the impression that if we're really good Christians, we'll never be afraid, we'll never have any doubts, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll like have it all together all the time. And, and, and that simply is, is not true. Then God goes on in verses 9 through 20 of chapter 44, um, really um, mocking these false gods. Um, and, uh, you know, he tells the story there. I'm not going to quote the whole thing, but he says, look, you, you go out, you cut down a tree uh, with, with half of it, you chop up for firewood to cook your food and to heat your dwelling. And the other half, you, you carve into a god. And, and then if anything happens, you have to save your god. You know, it can't save you. But, you know, if, if, if there's a fire, for example, uh, you have to run into the burning building to get your God so it doesn't burn up. Uh, and, you know, God's just pointing out how foolish and absurd uh, these false gods are. Now, uh, for us in 21st century America, uh, our gods are more subtle than that. They're, they're usually not, you know, little carved images that we carry around with us. Um, our gods are things like consumerism and militarism and nationalism. Um, our, we, we as a nation are, are known for our worship of mammon, um, for, for example. So uh, not that those idols are really subtle, but they're maybe less easily recognized as, as uh, uh, false gods. But nevertheless, they are. They're taking the place of God in people's lives. People are setting their hearts on them. They're giving their lives to those things rather than to God. And just like those little pocket idols that people used to carry around, um, they have no power to save ultimately. Remember, verse 21 says, These things, O Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you. You are my servant. Again, he's talking to the whole nation. Oh, Israel, do not forget me. 
I have swept away your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. I, I love that verse, or those two verses, because notice what they say. Notice that the sin, the transgression, is forgiven and removed even before we repent and return to God. Forgiveness precedes repentance and returning. Uh, there, there's a uh, uh, an evangelist who's who's uh, relatively popular in some evangelical circles, whose whole ministry is based on uh, convincing people that they are sinners and that they're going to go to hell. And and he says, in, in when you share the gospel, he says you 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 have to give them the bad news before you give them the good news. You've got to convince them. And he teaches people how to convince other people that they are terrible sinners and that they're going to wind up in hell. And, and then he says, you share the good news. That, that's not biblical. Um, look at the prodigal son, for example. The, the dad in that story had forgiven his son while, uh, long before he even thought about coming home, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so the prodigal son you know, he's rehearsing this speech that he's going to give, this 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 uh, confession that he's going to present to dad. But dad, dad's already forgiven him. Dad comes running to him and throws on the robe and the ring and the slippers and orders the calf to be slaughtered and such. And he doesn't even listen to, to the boy's, you know, speech or we, young man's speech about, uh, you know, I've sinned against God and you. I'm not worthy to be your son. He's, he's already forgiven him. So when you're sharing with other people, you, you don't need to convince people that they're sinners in danger of hell. What we do need to do is bring them the good news. The good news is that the cross took care of sin. As sin is forgiven. God's arms are wide open. He accepts all who will come. Sing, O heavens, verse 23 says, for the Lord has done it. Shout, O depths of the earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains, O forest and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob and will be glorified in Israel. Isn't that a beautiful poetic picture of the time when everything's going to be made new, when heaven is going to come to earth, when the veil is going to be taken away, when all evil and sin and darkness and death and everything bad is banished from the whole universe, and everything is saturated in the love of God. Uh, what a beautiful picture that's going to be, you know, uh, I, uh, beyond our imagination, um, almost as if, you know, uh, trees and mountains are breaking forth and singing. So God has promised that he's going to rescue us. Now he emphasizes, beginning here in chapter 44, verse 24, and running through verse, chapter 45, that there's only one rescuer. There is only one name under heaven and earth whereby we can be saved, and that is the name of King Jesus. Peter says that in Acts chapter 4 in his sermon. You, you guys can decide who you're planning to follow or what you want us to say, but I'm telling you, there's no other name. There's no other way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Our rescuer is God. Now, in the last verses of chapter 44, Isaiah predicts that God is going to use Cyrus the Great, who was the king of the Persians, to bring the Jews uh, whom God loved from their inception, from the womb, out of Babylon and help them rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. God gives that promise. And of course, that's exactly what happened. Um, the Persians conquered Babylon and in so doing inherited all these Jews that were dispersed throughout the Babylonian, what was the Babylonian Empire. And Cyrus had a different way of ruling. Uh, the Babylonians, uh, as I said, would deport people and disperse them and kind of keep them under control that way. 
Uh, what Cyrus did was he allowed people that he had conquered, and he conquered a lot of countries, he allowed them to stay in their country um, and basically practice whatever religion they wanted to, as long as they kept the peace and they paid tribute to him. Um, that was kind of a new way of doing things. Now, later on, Rome did the same thing, and uh, so it, it, it was practiced quite a bit after that. But that was the main difference between um, uh, the way Cyrus ran things and the way uh, Nebuchadnezzar ran things. So Isaiah predicts that God's going to use uh, Cyrus the Great to bring the Jews. He's, uh, and, you know, he did. When he conquered Babylon, he issued a decree, not immediately, but eventually he issued a decree that any Jews that wanted to go back to their homeland uh, could do so. And, and he appointed soldiers and such to to uh, keep them safe while they went back and rebuilt the temple. And we read about that in Ezra and Nehemiah. Um, and, and that was a role that he played. Uh, so God did use Cyrus, there's no question about it, but he's only an instrument. And he's not a great person. He was a brutal pagan warlord. Uh, it, it wasn't out of charity or because he knew God or anything that Cyrus did that. It was just, uh, in his view, the most efficient way to control an empire. Um, and, you know, as long as he was getting more land and more money, he was okay with it. <laughs> so he allowed the conquered people to return to their homelands and pay tribute. Um, and, uh, you know, from one perspective, you can back up and look at history and say, well, God allowed Persia to conquer Babylon. But then also you have to say, well, God allowed uh, um, Greece to conquer Persia. And God allowed Rome to conquer Greece. And, you know, we could keep going all through history. And it doesn't mean that God approves of any of those empires or, or any of those leaders necessarily. Um, it just means that uh, God uses the circumstances of history to bring about his purposes. So he invites us to join him in this rescue project. Uh, he, speaking through Isaiah, he, he calls upon those who are his people, and modern day, that's you and me, to do justice to the oppressed, to the poor, to the captives, to the people who are sick, to the people who are displaced, the people who are marginalized, the people who are disenfranchised, who don't have a voice in society. He says in verse 8, shower, O heavens, from above, and let the skies rain down righteousness. That word could also be translated justice. Let the skies rain down justice. Let the earth open up that salvation may spring forth and let it cause righteousness or justice to sprout up also. I, the Lord, have created it. And that's not a magical process. What God is calling us to fulfill that prophecy. How does God bring forth? How does God cause the skies to rain down righteousness? How does God cause justice to spring up from the ground? by motivating us to care for the poor and the disenfranchised and the broken and the hurting and visit the sick and uh, so forth and so on, to care for those people that Jesus described as the least of his sisters and brothers there in Matthew 25. And then God goes on to say, woe are they that strive with their maker. Well, why is it that we're always striving against God? We, we, I mean, by we, I mean humanity. Well, because we don't like God's plan. We don't like the way the kingdom of God is structured. It makes no sense to us. It's upside down. Uh, yeah, how are you going to run a kingdom without violence? Yeah, how are you supposed to get ahead without any kind of coercion? How are you supposed to bring justice about without killing bad guys? And, and, and you start talking about Jubilee, where everybody's sharing everything and nobody has any needs. I mean, that you know, that can't work. Uh, so, so, so we fight against God, you see? 
We, we bang heads with God, as it were. But look at what the answer to that question is. How are you going to change things for the better without violence, without coercion, without killing bad guys? Well, ask Martin Luther King Jr. Ask Gandhi. You know, uh, if we follow the ways of God, we are servants of God's kingdom, and we are advancing the kingdom of God on earth. And so when God says, woe to those who strive with their maker, earthen vessels with the potter, does the clay say to the one who fashions it, what are you making? Um, it, it's, 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 yet, you know, <laughs> we humans do it all the time. We read the Sermon on the Mount, and, and, and then we explain it away. We explain, oh, well, it's really, God didn't really mean that stuff. God really meant, uh, or that maybe that's for the kingdom age. That's when everything's going to be perfect. Or or maybe that Sermon on the Mount is, is just for, um, you know, little groups of cloistered saints off in the desert somewhere. You know, none of that's biblical. Jesus said, this is the way I want you to live. This is the way followers of me live. Um, you know, turn the other cheek, go the second mile, freely give. You free, freely receive, so freely give. Forgive your enemies. Pray for those that persecute you. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Um, and yet, uh, we have a tendency, I don't mean you and I, but I mean we humans, um, generally speaking, have a tendency to strive with God at makes as much sense as butting your head into a wall. Truly, you are a God who hides himself, O God of Israel, the Savior. Uh, oh, something to think about. Well, why is God described as someone who hides himself? Why is it that sometimes it feels like God is hidden? Like, you know, when you're going through a difficult time and um, you feel like, God, are, are you there? Why? why? Why, why does God allow those times, do you think? All of them are put to shame and confounded. The makers of idols go in disgrace together. But Israel is saved by the Lord with everlasting salvation. You shall not be put to shame or confounded ever again. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, he is God. Who formed the earth and made it, he established it. He did not create it in chaos. He formed it to be inhabited. This is what he says. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I did not speak in secret in a land of darkness. I did not say to the offspring of Jacob, seek me in chaos. I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. I think what God is saying there to the nation of Israel and as an extension to us, is when, yes, there are those times when we go through difficult situations, when we feel like God's not listening, when we feel like God's distant, even though in our heads we know he's not, but it, it feels like that. You feel, you feel um, out of sorts spiritually. You feel disconnected. Um, you feel like something's wrong. And sometimes those are, uh, you know, those times go on for a fairly long period of time. Um, why, why is that, and what are we to do? Well, I think we're to, what God's saying here is, back up and remember that I'm your creator, that I love you, and that I have revealed myself. How has God revealed himself? Well, first and foremost, and primarily through Jesus. Jesus is the Word of God. Jesus is the full revelation of who God is. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Jesus said, I always do those things which please the Father. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus, look carefully at Jesus, read the Gospels, listen to the words of Jesus, watch the actions of Jesus. That's the primary way that we know about God. Secondarily, we know about God through Scripture. 
Scripture points us to Jesus. The purpose of the Bible, Old and New Testament both, is to point us to Jesus because in Jesus is where we discover God. God also reveals himself in nature. You know, people say, oh, I, I find God in nature. Well, I, I'm not going to argue with that. Yes, it is. It's peaceful and beautiful. And, um, you know, the right setting can be very conducive to perhaps hearing what God is saying to you. But you're not going to get a full revelation of who God is until you get to Jesus. Um, nature can help. Another way that God reveals himself, and one that we don't think about that much, I don't think, is through people in need. You know, um, Mother Teresa used to describe the, the, the broken people in Calcutta that she ministered to uh, as Jesus in distressing disguise. You know, and when you, when you talk to somebody who's really in need, you know, someone who's, who's terminally ill, for example, in the hospital or in a hospice program or in a rehab facility or, or a homeless person on the street or, um, you know, someone who's incarcerated on death row for life, you know. Um, when, when you talk to people like that and when you, when you go to them with an attitude of these are women and men created in the image of God that God loves so much that he sent his son to die for. When you have that attitude, then your heart is open. And, and as you listen to them, if you take the time to listen to them, you'll see that God is revealing something of himself even through people like that. And of course, God reveals himself through our faith communities. I mean, this fellowship that we have, you know, it's, it's a little fellowship and it's by Zoom and, and we're in all different parts of the country. But as we share together, you know, before I, before my lecturing, you know, and afterwards, um, there, there's a connection that takes place between us. And, and as you listen to your sisters and listen to your brothers, um, and as you're open to their ideas, um, and, and where you're wanting to hear their hearts, you find God revealed there also. So I think what God is saying is, in those times when it seems like I'm hidden, uh, I'm still here. I'm still with you. I still love you. Look to Jesus. Look to scripture. Get off into nature, perhaps, to clear your mind. Go and listen to someone who is in deep need. Spend time with your sisters and brothers and hear their hearts, and you'll discover that God has not left you. God has not forsaken you. In fact, God is standing with, uh, figuratively speaking, with outstretched arms, welcoming everyone. Uh, there, there's a prayer in the uh, uh, Anglican Book of Common Prayer that says, uh, Lord Jesus, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross, that everyone might come to the saving knowledge of your grace. That's a beautiful picture of God, isn't it? God says here in verse 22, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. Not just Jews, everybody, anybody, everyone is welcome. For I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn, God can't swear by anything higher than himself because there isn't anything higher than himself. From my mouth has gone forth in righteousness a word that shall not return. To me, every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear. Eh, quoted, of course, in the New Testament, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. His arms are outstretched. He's welcoming, calling everybody, saying there's plenty of grace for everyone. Salvation is available to everyone. When Jesus was hanging on that cross, all sin was atoned for. There's no sin, there's no sinner so wicked that God will turn them away. Come to me, God says. He is welcoming, welcoming everyone into his kingdom, not coercing anyone, not forcing anyone, honoring everyone's free will, but welcoming everyone into his kingdom who will come.
Oh, Father, we come to you in the mighty, precious name of Jesus. Afresh and anew, we surrender ourselves totally and unconditionally to you, and we bring our loved ones by faith in prayer. All those that you've brought across our path who are in need of your touch, we bring them, Lord, in prayer to the foot of the cross. And we pray you'd open every heart of every one of our loved ones to see their need for you, to seek after you, to find you, and to experience the glorious love and grace of redemption. Amen. Amen.